Welcome to BurnerCast yet again. I am Joey Strutz. Got my co-hosts, Brett Hosmer and McKenna Seacrest here with us. How are you guys doing today? You know? I'm doing great. It's a beautiful summer day. <laughs> and she. I'm not a big fan of these Monday night recordings. I got to say, I'm a little bit tired today. I got my COVID jab tomorrow. So wish me luck if I don't show up for another other BurnerCast episode in the future. I just died of COVID. Oh, from the vaccine, but... You know, we'll be good. Yeah, it's it's really cool to see, you know, vaccine rollout starting to happen, especially with so many events coming back up here. Um, but we had a great episode for you guys today. Uh, this is our first time we're going to have multiple guests on the show. Uh, joining us today are two people who have really given back to the youth ballooning community, and they've ran multiple BFA youth camps. Uh, you know, we've all been to a camp at one point or another, and I, th I think it's been really instrumental in, you know, helping us with, you know, learning towards getting our license. Now, without further ado, please welcome Jeff Halixer and Carolyn Mum. Oh, they're back. And here we are. How are you guys doing? <laughs> doing great. Doing well. Hey, great to have you on the show. We're excited to be here. Yeah. Uh, so the first thing we're going to talk about is how did both of you guys get your starts in hot air ballooning? For me, it was, I got out of college and went for my first teaching job in Gallup, New Mexico. Uh, met a woman whose boyfriend was a balloon pilot. And the very first Saturday I was in Gallup, I went out and crewed and had my first flight. And, you know, the rest, as they say, was history. That was 1983. And for me, I moved to Reno in 2011, had ne never seen balloons before. Um, went to the Great Reno Balloon Race, just me and my family, and thought they were really cool. And the next summer discovered that it was all volunteers who put it on. And so I volunteered because I volunteer for everything. Okay, so I met a local student pilot, um, Barb, who was um, new Jeff as a, as a here in Reno and invited me to crew for him. And he was putting on the balloon camp and asked, they asked if I'd be interested in helping and that's how I started. I started just as helping with balloon camp and then crewing. And then a couple of years later, decided I wanted to be a, a pilot and took me a couple of years to get my student and uh, a couple of years to get my, or my private and my couple more years to get my, my commercial. Well, she, she was on the fast track compared to mine. It took me 19 years to get my private, you know, first balloon flight exposure to balloons till I earned it was 19 years. So. A slow learner. <laughs> well, that kind of leads into the meat and potatoes of this episode is, so we'll kind of start with Jeff on this one, since you've kind of been involved with the balloon camps longer, but how did you come to get involved in the balloon camps? Um, when I, I had my first, I bought a special shape balloon in 2007, did a few uh, paid events in 2008, and then decided I wanted to go on the road and hit balloon events across the country. And, you know, basically I marketed myself to the balloon events around the country. And I saw a post or, you know, an announcement probably back then it was on the, uh, on the reflector, the aeronaut forum or yeah, aeronaut league, uh, John Capurio's anyway. So I think I saw a post about the balloon camp. So I looked at my scheduling and I was able to fit it into my schedule and that was 2009. And I did uh, four years at the Michigan camp, uh, Tom Jones, who's not a pilot, but uh, you know, a balloon fanatic and an observer at competition events in Michigan, uh, put on the camp and that's how I got started volunteering with the camps. That's great. I remember attending your 2013 balloon camp which is the first one you put on and I was 13 it was such a good memory and then you also put on the 2015 and 2017 camp and attended the 2019 high sierra balloon camp so what made you want to start your own camp well you know Tom did a great job at the camp in Michigan but I felt as a pilot that I wanted to do things different, wanted to do things a little bit better, um, a little more in depth, a little more intense. And, you know, that's, you know, 
I was looking for my notes today. I wrote an article, but I've never submitted it to ballooning um, about my, you know, coming through the, you know, how my process came into being a camp director. But um, it was probably, you know, the, somewhere around the 11, 12, 10, 11, that I started putting out um, feelers, started making phone calls to the university to find out what it would cost and whether it was feasible to even, you know, access the dorms during the summer. And, you know, after the 2012 camp is when I started in, you know, serious on putting on the camp in 13. And yes, McKenna was at that one. It was a great time. See, it's just funny you mentioned doing things differently than the Great Lakes camp, because I was there in 2010 and 2011. And of course, I remember those days. I mean, Tom was terrified the one night we flew. You know, I thought he thought he was going to, you know, that was going to be the end of balloon camps. He was <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you remember it. You know, that was all, it was all tethers, tethers, tethers. And I mean, it's just funny to see how you've evolved it. And of course, I mean, you should be flying at balloon camps. That's what balloons are meant to do is mainly to fly. You know, that's the point exactly. of it. So I'm glad you made that adjustment for sure. Yeah. And that's, and that was one of the things, you know, back at the Michigan camp that, you know, the other pilots and I, kind of approached Tom and said, and just basically we kind of put our foot down and said, we want to fly. And, you know, he, like you said, he was nervous and, you know, apprehensive about it. But, you know, at that time, you know, it was just, you know, we went ahead and did it and it turned out great. And since then, you know, the camps here in, in Reno or in Truckee, you know, we've been able to fly, you know, at least, probably 80% of our flying opportunities we've been able to fly, you know, every day. And I think, I think that's such a good addition because, you know, some of my favorite memories in ballooning as a whole was coming out to the Reno camp in 2017 and flying out in Truckee. Cause I'm from, I'm from the Midwest. I, it's all flat out here. Like I, I, had <laughs> never, I literally before that camp had never seen mountains before. And being able to fly near them, it was it was so eye opening and really cool to me. I think that's the best part about camp, especially when kids come from everywhere else, because they get to fly in areas that they don't normally fly in. For me, I'm, I'm from the Midwest and now I live out here. All of my training and most of my flying is out here. I go back to the Midwest and your flying is so different than ours is. And that's the joy of balloon camp is we can ex we can let the kids experience all the, you know, a different kind of flying, a different kind of location. So, you know, leading into a camp, what do you guys look at logistically um, before, you know, kicking it off? <laughs> Everything, yeah, you know, it's... I don't think people understand. So pilots look at it as sort of a glorified balloon event, right? You have, you have your flights in the morning and then that's that the flights are really the smallest part of balloon camp. And as a director for me, I put the flight window, I pick pilots that are gonna be good during that flight window and I let them do their thing. Like it's not, that's like the three hours a day that I don't have to worry about because pilots know what they're doing. It's the housing, the um, sleeping arrangements, the classes, the sessions, the logistics of putting on a residential camp for teenagers those are the things, you know, you have to find a good location where you can house the kids and the adults can be separate. And that's close to a good flying area that generally has good weather and that there's propane and some fun things to do and activities and people who can come in. So all the pieces, it's a moving, it's a constantly moving process to figure out how camp goes. The schedule literally changes daily and up to camp and then we print it and then it changes basically every day at camp. <laughs> when I talk yeah. to other pilots um, and I just, and I'm talking about balloon camp, I tell them that it's like a safety seminar on steroids. Um, and that was part of my vision, you know, when I started thinking about the camps was to have the topics like a safety seminar. So I pulled up the BFA uh, guidelines for safety seminars, and we incorporated many, 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 many of those sessions were in part, you know, part of our camp schedule. Yeah, we literally do it like a safety seminar. The the three that we have to, 
the three that we should, and then we look at our pilots and what can they bring us or what can the people of the area. Here in Reno, we've got over 20 pilots. So we've got a lot of experience that we can bring into our camp. And so whoever can give us some time, um, we bring in so we can give, so we can hit um, everything that, that covers a safety seminar. Um, yeah. We've gotten safety seminar uh, credit from the BFA for every one of the camps that we've done here. That's pretty awesome. And I can tell just from attending camps that there's so much that goes into it. And while the camps are similar, they're also so different from each other every year. And I always like, even as a pilot, I learn so much from every camp that I go to. And it's just always a, a really unique experience. I always try to tell people that, you know, that know me or that have been to our camp or are looking to register for camp to make sure they try to hit all the camps, right? Because all, if, if you have the opportunity to hit the Albuquerque camp or the, you know, this summer there's the Southeastern camp. Um, I attended the Wisconsin camp. Um, my son, William, in 2017 was the summer before he was going to turn uh, 16 and he was going to do his pilot, he get his pilot certificate. And he spent a lot of the time talking with, we had Kay West there and he, he credits his time at camp with some of those sort of quote unquote trick questions from your oral um, and some of the things that he, you know, paid attention to as he got prepared for his check ride because he could have some one-on-one -on -one downtime. It's not 100% the teaching time, it's the downtime with the pilots. It's that, how did you come to that decision or what did this pilot do in that situation versus what that pilot did? And that's the joy of balloon camp is it's, like I said, those, the, the hours of flying are really important, but those 21 other hours are just as important, if not more, because there's so much that, that the kids can get out of it just in a laid back, you know, something pops in their mind and they can ask a question. Yeah, I really like the analogy of like a safety seminar because truly it's just honestly just a safety seminar for the youth. And mm -hmm. of course, you got you to be careful, you know, putting all the stuff in there that's in a safety seminar because you're not going to teach probably FARS to, you know, below 16 year olds. Because I remember mm -hmm. the old Great Lakes camp, we had a guy falling asleep at camp council. It was snoring, snoring off for two hours because it was FARS. I mean, it, it's, it's kind of funny the way you re talk about that. But yeah, I completely agree with that. You're trying to teach, you know, and the hard part about camps too is you have a short amount of window with kids. You know, there's mm -hmm. so much you want to teach them about ballooning, but you have kids from all different backgrounds. You have some that mm -hmm. I'm sure haven't touched a balloon at all. I know we had some of mine. And then you have some like Joey and McKenna that have all this experience. So it's, I'm sure you have to deal with a wide variety and almost it's a tough balance to deal with sometimes, I'm sure. Well, the joy of it is you can use those kids that have more experience, connect with the kids that have no experience and bring everybody along. Sort of that Montessori, you know, that kind of concept where, everybody shares their experience because in ballooning, as we all know, once you're, you know, once you become a pilot, you've got a lot of knowledge that you can share and we're all sort of trained to share those things. And so the kids get to share and learn how to share and how best to share with their peers. They learn best from their peers a lot of the times, you know. And this is, this is kind of, I've, oh, I've, 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 I did the camp in Michigan, did the camps here, but I also volunteered for Albuquerque one year I went back and did Pennsylvania one year. And so this is coming into my 10th camp this coming summer. And I remember going to my first camp in 2013. I didn't know, I barely knew anything about ballooning, um, like about the specifics. So coming to camp was like, it felt overwhelming, but you really start with the basics, like the parts of a basket, and then you slowly go into more detailed um things so it's a really good way to learn and I've met so many um kind of how you were talking about um the downtime is so important like I've met so many incredible pilots and people that I've learned so much from on the downtime at balloon camps and it's just like so meaningful to me and carries with me through all these years like I've met so many great people the connections made in balloon camp are what's important for me, you know, I, that, that finishes it off. You know, for me, a lot of the people that I know in the balloon community are people I know from my experiences with balloon camp. And that's how I've made those initial connections and met those people. And, you know, 
I know that there's somebody in a lot of different places that I can call if I need help from or Mm -hmm. all, you know, it just, it, that, and that's what I want to make for the kids. You know, that's the goal is that, you know, and that's what makes me so happy that we have so many kids coming from so many different areas because that way we all have connections all over. I think at every one of our camps out here, we've had (laughs) campers, you know, from basically across the United States. The year you were here, McKenna, you know, we had campers from Washington all the way back east to, you know, I think Michigan and even further east than that. So we have campers coming from, you know, all over to attend all the different camps, not just the Reno camp, but the Albuquerque camp, the South Carolina, the, you know, the Pennsylvania, you know, the Wisconsin camp. It's campers from all over. I was just pulling up our spreadsheet for this year's camp. We've got campers Right now we've got seven or 16 kids registered from uh, seven different con- or seven different states as far east as Ohio, um, Utah, Nevada, California. So all over. And that's what makes it fun is kids get to see something different. Yeah, and thinking back to when I did camp, you know, even though it was so long ago, I mean, another fellow camp kid that was there, I mean, I bought a balloon from him. I mean, it literally, you know, seven, eight years later, I bought my first balloon from him and young camp counselor, Adam McGee, who was like 18 at the time, maybe I can't remember how old he was. I mean, he ended up being the guy that trained me for much of my training. So it's kind of unique to think about it that way. So thinking on the topic of pilots, when you look for a pilot for camp, are they more approaching you or are you searching out pilots to kind of find the best camp counselors you can? Well, when I did it, it was, you know, I would, I, you know, no, you know, knowing the pilots that are in the local area, that's, that's important. And, you know, Gene Bernstein from New Jersey came out and helped with the camps that I put on here in 2017. Mm-hmm. And 2013. 19. 17 he and was 19. Here 13. 13, 15, 17, 19. Gene yeah. came all the way from New Jersey to volunteer for the camp here. I look for people that have the right kind of personality, someone that's going to be able to work with this, you know, the youth and, you know, and supply something more than just being a pilot, you know, bringing their balloon is part of it. Being a pilot is part of it, but being able to connect with the youth is probably a more integral part of, you know, being a camp pilot. And safety is key and and the basics, you know, they have to, they have to have a real strong, safe basics because we're the first introduction for some of these kids we're the first introduction to piloting and learning and training and instructing for these kids so we want to start them on a good safe basic um you know and then their flights you know and then after flights pilots that can talk to the kids and interact and and do you know bring things like more information and and different systems, different balloon systems. We always try to like lay down, okay, we don't have somebody with a firefly system yet. We don't have somebody with a, this kind of system. So we just try to, there's a lot of different layers of things we're looking for. For me, it comes both ways. There's me reaching out to pilots that I think would be really good or pilots that reach out to me. And then it just becomes a balancing act of getting sort of the right mix um, and the right experiences. You know, going kind of on a tangent here, uh, do you guys have any favorite memories from camp that come to mind, like off the top of your head? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. Uh, uh, probably more than, you know, I mean, all of every single camp experience is memorable. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, you know, as McKenna has said, and, you know, you and Brad, you know, it's just been it, there's so much that happens in that, you know, five or six days that it's hard to really pick out, you know, one yeah. or two things that are just noteworthy. Every camp is different. Mm-hmm. Every camp is, yet every camp is still the same. It's, it's teens being there wanting to learn about ballooning. And we've had, you know, like Carolyn said, we've had campers that have had absolutely zero balloon experience. Uh, one person from a year or so ago was researching online, you know, summer camps and spotted the balloon camp, had never been around balloons and came to camp and loved it, had an absolute blast, you know. I know for me, I guess probably my most heartwarming for me um, 
with as being a first time director in 2019 was, and it has to do with McKenna because McKenna started in 2013. That was her first camp. That was my first camp. That was my introduction to ballooning. She got her private the same year. I got my private. She got her commercial the same year. I got my commercial. I directed the balloon camp and she came in as a commercial pilot for my first year directing his camp. And for me, it was so wonderful to see that progression and have that situation happen where, you know, some of those kids that I started as campers when I started as, as a staff are now my peers on the balloon field and are the people that I reach out to um, and ask questions to. And, you know, they're now my peers in the process, which is incredibly heartwarming to me. Um, as much as I love camp, I, I call camp the best week of the summer. Um, I told somebody a couple years ago that, you know, take a nap because camp makes Fiesta look like kindergarten nap time. Um, <laughs> it, it just, I, I don't care how hard Fiesta is. It has nothing on camp because camp is 24 seven for six days. Um, but it's worth it. It's worth every single, every single minute, every little bit of stress coming up to it. The paperwork and the mess at the end of it, the, those, those five days or six days, five nights with the teenagers make it all worth it. And so for me, everything about camp is, is, you know, there's, there's parts of it that I like less than others, but <laughs> everything about camp just, it's, it's just the best week. It really is. I completely agree. And then Carolyn, you ran the High Sierra Balloon Camp last, or I guess summer of 2019. And mm -hmm. then you're going to be directing the camp this summer. So what's your vision for this camp and for future balloon camps? You know, it, it sort of naturally evolves. So this summer, um, due to COVID, we lost our location um, that we've sort of had for the last couple of years from a resident standpoint. And we're in a very different kind of residential situation um, where the kids are going to be in a lodge um, and the adults are going to be in campers around the lodge. And it's, it's, a, it's a much more laid back location. Um, it's on the side of a ski hill. So we have, the, the, we have some open areas, some place to be. Um, we've got a, a parking lot that has a place where we can set up the balloons. We won't have to get up early to go tether. We can literally walk down to the parking lot, which will be nice. Um, and our flying area is gonna be a little bit different this year. Um, we're gonna be down in the valley here in Reno. Um, and so every year it sort of adjusts and moves and that's the exciting part of it. Um, I, I see camps moving in the direction. I would, I would love to see camps moving to one more, one more step or sort of, I, I, I've, I've had a vision for a few years now on one more step of a camp where all these, these kids that are close to getting their private or, or have their private that we could do um, almost like a dual camp situation where there's, there's two camps on a site. Um, one where the kids are getting some sort of higher level flight experience um, some real, real in-depth, you know, an hour of FARS for a kid that's going to do their check ride at the end of this summer is much more beneficial than an hour of FARS for that kid who's just being introduced to balloons, but both things would be valuable. And I think every year I have somebody ask me if we can sign off for a ground school, which we're not, but sort of going more in depth, having a camp that's a little bit more in depth. Um, and then Going backwards, I would like to see, and it's actually happening in a couple locations, hopefully, hopefully this summer, some a lower level camp, a more introductory day camp experience that allows us to um, go to have a camp for kids from some of these events that bring in take take the joy and the excitement of the events and develop kids who might come into the sport um, in a day camp concept. I think they're doing one in Utah. I think perhaps in Florida. Um, this summer where, you know, just a local kid can get more, in, more involved in ballooning and they, they, and then invite them in the future to come to a balloon camp, um, an overnight residential balloon camp. So that's so, sort of going back, you know, going forward with it a little bit and going backwards a little bit. Um, and then bringing in new, um, new staff, new younger staff, new directors. Um, so we can have um, this next generation of balloonists start running some of these camps as well. I love doing it, but I won't do it forever. And, and you know, there's people out there <laughs> that, um, you know, can start, start being more active in the organization part. 
So you kind of touched on COVID there for a minute. Other than having to change locations, how is that going to affect 2021 compared to 2019 camp? Um, you know, our, our, our location where we're sleeping is bigger. The kids will be farther apart. Um, we'll wear, we're trying to keep everything in house. Um, in the past, we've gone to a local historical city and spent the day. We're not going to do that. Um, the risk of bringing people in and then putting them out in our community is, wasn't the best choice. Um, the repair shop visit we will most likely still do, um, but we'll just go to the repair shop and come back. Um, we are hoping still to go visit the um, commercial operation at Lake Tahoe, but we won't necessarily be a part of their guests. So it's just getting our kids in, um, making sure, checking them on a daily basis, making sure they're staying healthy, and then sort of staying in our little group um, for that week and then sending them all safely home. And, you know, for kids and staff. We're, you know, we've, we've wrote, we put together, Carolyn and I, Carolyn mostly, I just kind of was, you know, my, threw in my two cents worth, um, a whole COVID policy dealing with everything and following everything that the CDC has come down with. There's an American Camp Association, which puts, which is summer camps of all varieties throughout the whole country. And, you know, we've been, you know, use their guidelines as kind of a framework and then we've dialed it in and tuned it up to fit the balloon situation that we're dealing with. So that policy was written back in February. Um, and then as camp directors, um, the BFA camp directors are meeting about every two to three weeks and we're fine tuning it as things change. Um, you know, we're requesting or suggesting that everybody have a vaccine if it's possible. So most, you know, so, it's not a requirement, but you know, just just trying to keep everything we can as safe as possible to keep the people, you know, the staff and the pilots that are there. Um, we'll have masks on. We're going to be outside. We're going to do our classes outside as much as we can. Um, we will, you know, just just being aware is is our main goal of of the areas of risk. Much with, that we've done, you know, all year long. I know personally, I've flown a lot. Um, you just have to be aware that. Of, of the of the risks that are out there. So what are your guys' hopes when it comes to, you know, more youth getting in ballooning? Do you guys have like a plan to draw more people in or anything? Well, you know, I mean, the BFA would like to think that every kid that comes to camp is going to become a balloon pilot. And that's not necessarily reality. I mean, thinking back to the camp in 2013, we had uh, a brother and sister, and the and, and the older sister was part of that camp. You know, two of those three were working on their, they were still in high school. You know, so these are kids that are still in high school getting ready. You know, they're, they've got high school to finish up, hopefully going on to college. You know, eventually, maybe someday, you know, they will become balloon pilots. But one of those kids back then, she was working on her uh, black belt in mixed martial arts. So she had a little bit of a, not only was she in high school and probably in the AP and the honors classes, but she was also trying to get her mixed martial arts, you know, black belt. So that was where her focus was more th so than ballooning. Now she's in college, possibly in a year or two when she graduates from college, she'll be getting a hold of, you know, Carolyn or myself or McKenna and saying, I want to train and become a balloon pilot. You know, is it producing pilots? Yes. But are all the kids that attend camp going to be pilots? No. Mm -hmm. It's so cool because I remember meeting their family in 2013 and they're, they remain to be best friends of mine. So it's kind yeah. of cool. Yeah. And then do you guys have a favorite camp that you can recall? Like Everyone that you attended. You <laughs> Everyone that you attended. Everyone that I attended? <laughs> yes. Nobody else, <laughs> well, just <thank> you. you. <laughs> no, yeah. I, I mean, every single camp that I've done has been different. Even, you know, the, the, you know, the three years that I put them on here, the two years that I've done them here, you know, with Carolyn as the director, you know, the camp in Pennsylvania, the camp in Albuquerque, every camp has its own unique flavor. And mm -hmm. it's the camp directors that, you know, guide how, 
you know, it's kind of like a, a teacher in a classroom. You know, the teacher can make or break a class. You know, you could have a really boring class, but if you've got a great teacher, you're going to enjoy it. And the mm -hmm. same thing with the camp. You know, the camps have their own unique flavor and style based on what the camp director's vision is. You know, no matter where you are for camp, the goal of the camp and, and, and the goal of any camp, you know, no matter how they do things is to introduce ballooning to the next generation of balloonists. And for me, that's where my heart is. You know, it doesn't really matter how we do it or what class we teach or, you know, there's always going to be something that's more, more, you know, fits my view of things better or is like, wow, I really would have, you know, that's really cool how they did that. But to, to get to watch the campers learn about camp and learn about balloons and develop those friendships, you know, one of the campers um, from the 2017 camp maybe wrote an article for their local paper. And they said, you know, their favorite thing about camp was that they found a group of people that were a group of, they were able to find a group of teenagers from around the country that were as excited about getting up at 6 a.m. in the morning to play with, to, to handle balloons as, as they were. And that's what it is, is making those connections. That's what's important. And no matter who does the camp or how the camp runs, those connections are the, the true, those, those, that's across all the camps. So before we get into our fan questions, we have one little last topic for you guys. Okay. Uh, what is on your ballooning bucket list that you haven't achieved yet? I want to fly every state, every county in Nevada. So I've got, I think, three or four left. Um, I want to fly in the state parks. Um, I, ballooning has been my ability to take my boys and travel um, and see. And every time I drive, every moment that I drive, I'm looking out. Oh, I wonder if this would be good to fly. So I don't have a specific bucket list, just flying all those experiences. Um, I got the opportunity um, through my work with camp, honestly, to fly in Custer, South Dakota last summer. It was so much fun. Um, the different pilots I've met have introduced me to different events that are all over. And so for me, it's just continuing to fly in different areas. Um, I love flying where I fly. I absolutely love flying here, but it's always a fun challenge to go and fly in someplace different. I don't really have, you know, a, a bucket list. In fact, people ask about, oh my God, this is, this, this is on my bucket list. And I, I personally don't have a bucket list. Because to me, a list is limiting. Um, I would rather just, if the opportunity comes up, I'm going to say yes. Yeah. You know, whether, you know, I've flown at events across the country, you know, traveling with the special shapes, um, you know, and enjoyed that. And I would love to get back, you know, to some of the Eastern events again, you know, because I, and I enjoyed flying Kentucky. I enjoyed Rhode Island, New Hampshire, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, you know, Kentucky, you know, they, I just, I just want to fly and, you know, just experience as much as I can. So for me, it's not a list. It's the opportunity comes up. I'm going to say yes. I feel like you're the type of person you're just like living your best life, just going on these adventures, just like hanging out, just living. Uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's traveling and I just, you know, I sleep in my trailer in between events and, you know, the, the events pay for the hotel. And then from one event to the next event, I might have between three and five days to get to travel and see the United States and experience, you know, our country because it's a beautiful place. So with that, we're going to go into our weekly fan and panelist questions. So, you know, we'll get, we'll get questions from fans each and every week. Some of them are related to ballooning, others aren't. Um, this first one I got for you guys, kind of off of a tangent. Um, so do you guys have a favorite Marvel movie? <laughs> um, I don't watch TV and I, I don't watch very many movies. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> a TV person. You know, now if it was... Now, if it was a Marvel <laughs> comic book, that I might be able to stretch my brain and think about a comic book that I saw, you know, 20 years ago. But, you know, I'm not much for movies, but, you know, but, you know that was definitely an odd question. But, you know, that's the nice thing about fan I, questions is they, they can be way different. 
I remember I have this distinct memory at camp in 2013. You're like, I hate technology and I don't even own a TV. Like I don't watch any movies. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I have a television. I've turned it on four times in the last 15 years. So you, you and know? I talked about this on the phone earlier today, actually. We had, <laughs> that's one of the questions we asked to every set of guests we get. And coming into the question, I'm like, Oh, I'm pretty I, sure I know the answer. Answer this one, but I'm 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 gonna put it out there anyways. <laughs> My kids are gonna now insist that I watch them watch some of them, so at least I have a better answer next time. <laughs> um, do you guys have a go-to pre-flight meal? Go-to what? Pre-flight uh, pre meal. Coffee. Pre-flight. Always meal? coffee. Always a cappuccino if possible when I'm home. When I'm traveling, I have my coffee. Um, and then something with a little bit of protein. Um, oftentimes either granola bar nuts and like, you know, some kind of nuts and seeds kind of thing. Um, banana on toast. I, I lean more towards the Mountain Dew and peanut butter cup. Uh, I'm with you there. Actually, I think we pretty much have the same pre-flight meal. <laughs> you know, it's, it's something like something that's in the fridge. I can grab it and hit the road because <laughs> In the summertime, when I'm flying up at uh, Prosser Reservoir near Truckee, I make my call to flight service like right at five o'clock and I'm hitting the road within five or 10 minutes after that because I've got a 45 minute drive to get up there to be up there by sunrise. Right. You know, so, you know, I, I need some, you know, I don't, I don't make a big breakfast. I'll go to breakfast afterwards. And, you know, that's, that's, that's kind of a must do and uh, you know, eat them. So much like professional athletes who have a song when, you know, during introductions, if you guys get to choose like a walk-up song at events, uh, what, what song would you choose? For me, it would depend on my mood, probably um, Tightrope from uh, uh, The Greatest Showman. I love that song. <laughs> or Burn, cause that's, um, it was a glow in Havasu where I decided to go from um, crew to being a pilot and that's the song they were playing that night the song burn so probably one of those two I don't have any favorites I, I would think that you know for me it would be you know some old classic rock and roll of some sort but I can't pick mm -hmm. any specific tune if you guys could have lunch with one ballooning legend past or present who would it be mm -hmm. Personally, for me, I would think it would probably be, you know, Ed Yost or Malcolm Forbes, one of those two, you know. I mean, I've, I've met Don uh, Picard and Don Cameron and a number of other, you know, of the old school pilots. And, you know, but I think Ed Yost would be one that would be an enjoyable, you know, lunch or breakfast after flying. You know, for me, I don't have one in particular that jumps into my mind. I just thoroughly enjoy really any time with other pilots talking about flights and things that happened and, you know, all that BS balloon stories that we talk about all the time. I mean, that I just enjoy anything about ballooning and, it, you know, it need to be somebody I could ask questions of because I ask a million questions. So what is the first event that you both flew as pilots? I, I think the first event I flew was probably Alturas, California in 2002. I got my pilot certificate in March or April of 2002, and it was probably um, Alturas, California in September of that year. And mine was actually Alturas as well, only I got my private in 2016 and flew in May of 2016, and then flew in Alturas was my first event um, that year as well. What is the most random thing that has been found in the big blue trailer? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Uh, you know, I, I always tell people to make sure that they've got all their stuff because anything that's left behind, I have a garage sale and I take all that leftover, you know, stuff that's left and I, put all that money into the propane fund. Um, I can't think of, you know, I mean, bandits probably drug in more random things than, you know, uh, people have left, but, you know, it's just your normal sort of, you know, things that you'd find in a chase truck. 
You know, I'm not I'm not finding anything that would be, you know, very embarrassing. <laughs> Darn it all. That would be a lot of fun, you know. We can arrange for it, I'm sure. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's the biggest challenge to running a balloon camp that people most likely don't think about? Food. Huh? Cooking food. Providing food for teenagers. The scheduling. You know, you gotta feed them before. You got to feed them after and any kind of normal food service is not our schedule. Um, I am beyond excited that we have a facility that's cooking the food for the kids this year because every year that I've been involved since we left UNR, um, I've cooked the bulk of the food in my kitchen and froze it and taken it up and found some wonderful volunteer who never comes back twice to serve the kids. Um, and so just, just feeding the kids. Um, I was born in the Midwest. It's all about the food and taking care of people. So <laughs> for me, that's the biggest stress. And once I hand that off, the rest of it's pretty easy. I think just the, the overall logistics of any camp, yeah. and it doesn't matter where it is, is, you know, and as I told Carolyn years ago, the schedule is what drives the whole program. The schedule, you know, putting together a tight schedule uh, not only for the campers benefit, but also a schedule that, you know, the pilots know what is expected of them is so important. So to me, the, the key piece to a, a camp is, you know, the scheduling. Uh, so last question we got for you guys. Uh, what is your favorite place in the world to fly? People ask that quite often. And my, you know, my snappy answer for that dumb question is in the air. Um, why you know, do I know your exact answer? <laughs> you know, but I mean, I, I just want to fly and it really doesn't make any difference. Where, you know, to me, the prettiest place that I fly is Gallup, New Mexico. Um, you know, and that would be, you know, but I've not flown Letchworth Canyon in New York. And that's one of those places that I would love to get back for. Um, I would love to fly in Georgia for the Helena to the Sea that Tarp Head puts on. You know, there's... Flying everywhere is beautiful, um, but to me, the prettiest place and my favorite place that I love to go back to year after year is Gallup. For me, you know, I travel in the summer and I have these great experiences at all these different places. After 2019 camp, um, like two days after camp, we hit the road and went and got, I got the opportunity to fly in Ghost Ranch, New Mexico, um, which was exhausting because I was still so tired, but I wasn't going to give it up. And it was an utterly beautiful place to fly. Um, I hit the road in the summer and every place I fly, I love to fly. And then I get home and I'm so happy to fly at home because I fly at the base of the Sierra mountains. It is incredibly beautiful here. Um, so I, I'm much like Jeff, you know, basically in the sky and I love every place I fly. It's, it's just, it's just beautiful. Well, that's going to do it for us this week on BurnerCast. Uh, okay. Carolyn, Jeff, thank you guys so much for coming out to the show. Been a great time talking with you. Next week, we got uh, Kim McGee joining us on the show. Uh, going to be our next special guest. Uh, well, thank you guys all for tuning in. We'll see you next time on BurnerCast. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.